Hello, I'm Nicholas Thompson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Wired. I'm joined here with Kai-Fu Lee. He's the president and chairman of Sinovation Ventures and one of the founders of the field of artificial intelligence. Kai-Fu, it's such a pleasure to see you. Great to see you, Nick. So you're one of the inventors of artificial intelligence. You wrote my favorite book on artificial intelligence. You've taught us all a lot about artificial intelligence. And now we have perhaps the greatest crisis of our lifetime across the world. And you've given AI a B minus in helping to resolve it. Why is that? Why such a low grade? Well, B minus is a lot better than passing. It's not ideal. The reason is AI works uh, by accumulating a lot of data and seeing recurrence of similar events in order to make accurate predictions. And pandemic is once a century activity. There isn't a lot of experience building models and there isn't a lot of data. Uh, despite that, there are many places where AI has added value. So therefore the B minus. So why don't you walk us through the places where artificial intelligence has been helpful in combating the coronavirus and the places where it hasn't really done that much. Two personal examples. I live in China and uh, contact tracing is working uh, quite well. Uh, I get a red, yellow, uh, and um, green signal on my phone telling me whether I have, may have been in contact with someone who has the virus and therefore need to do a checkup. That is a way of uh, informing people about the status. Uh, second thing is uh, I was in quarantine when I returned to Beijing and uh, all, my, all the things I ordered by e-commerce, takeout food, were delivered by robot. So I was really zero in zero contact with people uh, because robotics is now working well enough when, within structured environments like apartment buildings, uh, hospitals, and uh, stores, and office buildings uh, doing things like temperature checking. Uh, also, AI has made some contributions in helping drug discovery uh, building, uh, di discovering new virus, uh, new uh, antivirus um, vaccines. And also uh, AI has been uh, used in warehouses to, uh, to do uh, the, the massive number of packages that are sent by e-commerce. So these are some of the contributions that uh, we see. Of course, there are also prediction uh, engines. Uh, early on, there was a company called Blue Dot that actually predicted that there may be a serious pandemic coming. Of course, it wasn't released to the world, but I think in the future, now that we've seen the damage of a pandemic, I think then if there is a next pandemic or a second wave, the predictions will be much more accurate. One of the areas where people may have expected AI to be very useful where it hasn't been, has been in vaccine development. There are a few examples, for example, Moderna, when they were trying to figure out which protein to build to build a potential vaccine, did use AI to model a series of options. But we did not have what many people hoped we'd have, which is the ability to simulate a human being and to identify potential vaccines. How far away are we from that? I think that's hard, uh, impossible to predict right now. Uh, we're uh, in a very urgent situation. So all the people working on vaccine uh, development are using the low hanging fruits. So they're not really going all out for that. One company we invested in called In Silico Medicine uh, used generative chemistry aided by AI to predict the types of compounds that may block uh, the spread of the virus. So there are similar techniques uh, to that, basically retargeting uh, existing AI technologies in places that are low hanging fruits. I think what you're talking about uh, really a new, a brand new way of doing vaccine development. Uh, hopefully the pandemic will give us a uh, running start and uh, we'll make progress towards that, but it will be, uh, I think too aggressive to predict that uh, this will be a huge difference made by AI this time. But what I mean is how high is the fruit, right? So will the next pandemic, will we be able to very quickly develop a vaccine because of AI? Will it take 10 years till we're there? Well, I'm going to be an optimist and say yes, but I really don't have the solid grounding to prove that.
Well, if anybody's predictions have some value, yours probably have some predictive value in them. Let's talk a little bit about um, the industries that are going to change. So one thing that is going to happen with the coronavirus is it's going to turn our economy upside down. It's changing all kinds of industries. It's massively changing my industry, media, right? It's changing online education in crazy ways. It's changing telemedicine in fascinating ways. What are the industries that you think will change and will be most affected by artificial intelligence? Uh, clearly, healthcare is one because of the huge focus on healthcare. And also, I think historically, healthcare was developed with largely optimization for people to be the doctors and the scientists inventing the medicine, uh, deciding diagnosis. But yet, um, AI has so much to offer in terms of um, uh, personalized, uh, targeted diagnosis, more accurate due to uh, genome sequencing, new technologies like CRISPR coming out, potentially combined with AI. Uh, and also, there are a lot of inefficiencies in healthcare. Uh, insurance were not designed with the, all the healthcare data. So I think all of these uh, will uh, compound and make healthcare plus AI the, the biggest potential. Uh, and there is one issue with healthcare, which is whether the data can become accessible. In countries where there are strong uh, protection, such as the HIPAA, uh, even with anonymized data, it may be hard to aggregate the data for training AI. And AI really up runs on data. So that would be an issue that each uh, country and each company has to, has to figure out. Uh, another is education that you talked about. People are changing their habits about uh, going to school. A billion kids are across the world learning online. And suddenly we see all these ways of using online AI technologies, whether it's AI teachers, uh, AI to help you fix your pronunciation, AI to figure out what uh, areas you're having trouble in math or English, uh, that can all be added to make the human-to-human -human interaction more about um, uh, learning the methods, helping to motivate learning, individualized, but using AI for the routine part of education. Uh, lastly, I think work as a general category is shifting uh, online. You know, we're conducting all of our meetings, we're making investments, potentially without even ever meeting the entrepreneur. And people are making deals online. So this change of habit of being able, willing to have uh, meetings and make decisions and helping to cr change the uh, work process into a digitized process. This digitalization turns everything into data. And once you have data, you have AI potentially coming in to improve the margins, improve the efficiency, uh, and also a huge ch potential challenge is you have AI potentially coming in to say, well, everything is digitalized. Why don't we use AI to do this workload instead of people? Uh, so that it will accelerate uh, automation and potentially cause a faster churn in terms of AI replacing people. So this is fascinating. So right now you and I are talking across screens. You're on the other side of the world, I'm in an attic in upstate New York. We should be in Aspen talking to each other, but here we are. It's all digital. Yeah. So the fact that this conversation is all digital and all the other work conversations I've had today and we'll have tomorrow are all digital, you think will lead to some kind of unknown advance in AI that will make human work disappear more quickly? Oh uh, yes, to give you an example, in the pre-pandemic world, there are lots of companies that uh, re require people-to-people -people interaction. So people go to work, they have meetings, people take notes, they write on paper, and they have records, um, and they call each other. But now that all the work is essentially operated and run online, then everything from meetings to decisions to workflow becomes digital. And once it's digital, uh, the, the com company's management will see, oh, there's that part of um, expense report uh, decision-making that could be done uh, by, by AI. There's that part of customer service. We could simply have an AI agent rather than human agent. Oh, the sales process, all this telesales uh, could be done by AI uh, with either automated speech generation synthesis or even synthesis of digital humans. So 
pieces of corporation and their workflow uh, will become automated faster because it's already online and digital. So in your book, AI Superpowers, and let me just pause for a little PSA here. If anybody is watching, you have not bought Kai-Fu Lee's book, AI Superpowers, you should, it's superb. In your book, you talk about the future of work and you have, a, you have two charts. And one of them is about um, you know, job and workforce. And you say that you have a y-axis, which is human interaction, and an x-axis, which is creativity. And so a job that requires a lot of creativity and a lot of human interaction is not likely to be replaced by machines, like a CEO job. And a job that has not a lot of creativity and not a lot of human interaction, like a telemarketer, will be replaced by machines. How does your chart change with the post-coronavirus era? I think the chart basically remains the same. The basically the replacement curve, if you will, going taking over the jobs, that's going to go faster. Uh, I also think the pandemic will potentially cause certain types of jobs to be more uh, more accelerated in their replacement because you know we would think uh, healthcare, hospital jobs, we would want the human touch, empathy, et cetera. But human touch in the period of the pandemic increases the likelihood of spreading of the virus. So uh, if there were a smart robot that could move med medical supplies and maybe uh, help the patients with some uh, testing their uh, blood pressure, et cetera, uh, we, we would be, I think we as humanity would be more willing to embrace that. Similarly, waiters and waitresses in restaurants, we would think there is value in the human interaction. However, those are dangerous jobs to have. And certainly at the uh, fast food and uh, lower cost restaurants, they will be uh, more replaced. By, by automation and AI. And actually in China, in many of the lower cost restaurants, uh, you see uh, people doing, taking orders on mobile phones and the waiter waitresses are just delivering the food and you'll also pay on your phones. So that already reduces the cost. And there are also many restaurants that have AI robots delivering the food because the restaurant, like the apartment building and the hospital are structured environments. Robotics work, uh, walking around, in, sorry, moving around in a structured environment is much easier. These are not robots that have feet and hand. They think of them as just carts that basically move to your table, make some sound to let you know to take your own ordered food uh, to your table. So those kinds of jobs that we would think uh, require some human interaction are potentially going to uh, uh, turn into automated jobs faster in because of the pandemic. Do you think using a similar logic that we're soon going to have self-driving taxis or that the move towards self-driving vehicles will be accelerated because we don't want to be near human drivers? Not as much because the in order to get to the L5, which is the highest of the five level of autonomous vehicle, there's still a lot of technical challenges to be overcome. So I think the taxis and Uber will continue to be needed. Uh, we, we will see um, a AI taking, I think, in uh, taking over automating human jobs in the warehouse, some of the manufacturing, uh, driving on highways and buses, probably in that order. The taxi and Uber will be the last uh, to be uh, fully automated. And I just want to make sure I fully understand your argument, which is we've all known that AI and robotics will be replacing human jobs, but there are two factors here that are accelerating it. One, we don't want as much human interaction, right? We don't want to be near the waiter. And two, so much more of our life is digitized and AI runs off data. Is that correct? Is there a third factor or just those two? No, I think those are the two main factors from the pandemic. Let me ask you about something you mentioned um, a few minutes before. You were talking about healthcare and data and HIPAA. And you mentioned that countries that have strong healthcare regulations, like the United States, won't have as much data and therefore may not have as many advances in artificial intelligence. My view is that we're going to care a lot less about privacy in the future than we do now. So perhaps, actually, countries like the United States will start loosening up access to data, for better or for worse. Is that fair? I think that would be a plausible outcome because I think people are starting to realize privacy is not a binary uh, 
issue. It's not that, it's also not an issue that trumps everything else. Uh, it is, needs to be considered in the context of public health, greater social good, and personal security. So while we want everyone to have their privacy, not being taken away by companies, et cetera, as much as possible, but when it provides a solution to the public health or greater security for each individual, um, and perhaps some incredible, income, uh, incredible convenience for people, then uh, we should really consider it in the context of how much benefit it is providing uh, and provide each person with some degree of choice because there will always be people who feel privacy is the most important. So to the extent that each country develops a set of regulations that uh, maintains what I said above, then uh, the appropriate amount of data collection, anonymized data can be aggregated and AI can be trained. China is quite a few months ahead of the United States in its response to the coronavirus. They're clearly on different paths, on different cycles. The United States has not done as good a job at knocking it out after it first came. Tell us what we have to expect, assuming we eventually get on the China trajectory. What do we have to expect in terms of AI and technology that will come along the way? There are many things that are uh, fundamentally cultural and very difficult. I think China has gone through SARS, uh, as have many Asian countries, and therefore, the, and also culturally speaking, people are more willing to be disciplined for their own safety and for the safety of the society. That's going to be hard to change um, and, until a country has experienced uh, some of the, uh, the challenges. But some of the possibly doable things include, I think, uh, certainly uh, contact tracing uh, based on an understanding that privacy is important, but public health is equally or maybe even more important. Uh, secondly, when there is a significant spread, actually wearing masks is in important, but it's really most important when everyone wears it. So when it's purely voluntary, uh, it's not going to be as effective. So when, when pandemic was in a uh, serious situation in China and other Asian countries, you go on the street, everyone's wearing a mask because of the purpose of the mask is not mostly not to protect you, but to protect other people in case you have it. Therefore, everyone has to wear it. Uh, these, I think, are the two biggest things uh, in case there is a continuing challenge or a second wave. If people would do that and get it close to zero, then actually the new normal, uh, as we see in China today, is not that far from, uh, from normal. Well, actually, of the things that you've described in this conversation, I'm fine with wearing a mask, I'm fine with contact tracing, but I do really look forward to the robot delivering my dinner. <laughs> well, that actually works incredibly well. It's a little bit related to how people live. Most people, like myself in China, live in urban condo or apartment buildings. That makes the robot delivery much easier. You've got the, uh, the delivery from the restaurant to the apartment building. Then the apartment building manager uh, handles delivering the last mile from the first floor to your apartment. Uh, because in the U.S., most, uh, most people live in houses, uh, it's a little more complex because then the robot has to figure out how, how to... Uh, deal with the last mile. Yeah, well, ideally with the right AI and the right robot engineering, we can solve those problems. Thank you so much, Kaifu Lee. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for your insights and all of your, the wonderful things you said. Well, thank you, Nick.